All right, welcome everyone to another episode of We Are In This Together. And my guest today is Sadaf Jafar, Dr. Sadaf Jafar. Welcome to our studio. Thank you. So Sadaf Jafar is an elected official, scholar and activist. She's first, she was first elected to Montgomery Township Committee in 2017. In January of 2019, she was sworn in as a mayor, becoming the first South Asian woman to serve as a mayor of a municipality in New Jersey, also the first Muslim woman to serve as the mayor of a municipality in the United States. She has focused her administration on good governance and increased transparency, communication, diversity, and inclusion. She founded Montgomery Mosaic, a group allied with the National Not in Our Town, an IOT movement, to combat prejudice, build connections throughout the community. Dr. Jafar is also a postdoctoral research associate at Princeton University, where she teaches courses on South Asian, Islamic, and Asian American studies. Jafar serves on the board of directors of the New Agenda, an organization that promotes women's economic empowerment and combats sexual harassment and sexual assault. She is on the advisory board of Inspiring South Asian American Women, a group dedicated to encouraging civic engagement among South Asian American women in New Jersey. She is also the advisory board of ART, A-R-T-E, Art and Resistance Through Education, a nonprofit that promotes human rights education and youth development through the arts. Jaffer earned her bachelor's degree in foreign service from Georgetown University and obtained her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from Harvard University with a secondary field in studies of women, gender, and sexuality. She is bilingual in Urdu and English and proficient in Hindi, French, Persian, and Arabic. We Are and This Together is an unscripted live nonprofit broadcast by Dearborn Blog to have conversations that become oral history records of our lives during the COVID-19 pandemic, also known as the coronavirus pandemic. These are personal stories of our lives during the unprecedented social isolation measures in a globalized world. Welcome, Sadaf, again. Thank you so much for having me. Should I call you Sadaf or Dr. Sadaf? Sadaf is fine. Okay, take your permission. Um, so uh, these are personal stories during the pandemic. We've started them like March, mid-March. And as you can tell, the stories have changed drastically. Our um, and 2020 has not ceased to impress and uh, shock, <laughs> shock and awe, as President Bush once said. Uh, so uh, it's there is a lot to talk about. I'll try as much as I can to refrain from talking on what we should talk about <laughs> and to focus on the personal stories because these are lost among all the topics of the day. Uh, and these are intended to be oral history records for the future. Uh, we always read in history. I'm a big history buff. I don't know how I ended up there, although I'm a software engineer in training. Um, um, you always read the history, the, the, the wars and treaties and genocides and catastrophes are very well documented. But the personal stories are not documented. And, you, you know, you've, you're... A big academic in that field, and you, and you know that the, the effect of uh, of the availability of these documents, like in Islam, for example, we have all these books about all these different topics. But when it comes to just basic sociology, we, we have very few to rely on, like Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Battuta. Um, so this this is the intention of this, and as an academic, um, you'll appreciate uh, this. Absolutely. Um, First of all, let's talk about uh, Montgomery. Uh, I'm going to share my screen just for a second because every time we have someone from a different part of the world and it's a learning opportunity. So uh, Montgomery is in New Jersey and it's right between Pennsylvania and New York. Are you about two hours uh, from New York, Sadaf? We're about an hour and 10 minutes from New York City and the same distance from Philadelphia. Wow. What a great place to be. Yes. <laughs> and how far are you from Princeton University? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. It's uh, pretty much the area of Princeton, right? Yes. Yes. And it's a small town of about, what, 25,000? Yes, 23,000. 
Um, so what led you to uh, live in that uh, part of the world? Well, uh, we originally moved here when my husband got a position at Princeton University and uh, I was finishing up my PhD and then eventually both of us got uh, teaching positions at Princeton. So that's really what brought us to New Jersey and we've made it our home and uh, you know, gotten very involved as you can see in, uh, in civic life here, so. Yeah, pretty much yeah. the number one most involved person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in you can say that. <laughs> yes. So uh, I know it's an, uh, you've been interviewed a lot of times. Uh, I've seen a few of the videos, uh, interviews with you. Uh, the last video I saw is you speaking in the uh, Imam Hussein's uh, commemoration, uh, which was very interesting from a you know public official uh, point of view. Um, so uh, there is a great content out there. So I want to refer people. I want to repeat the same questions to you. Usually you're asked about your journey to become uh, a mayor, and uh, which uh, I, I will probably touch on it a little bit. But I want to refer those who are interested in more about your story to the videos already available on uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, I also uh, hope to hear your laugh that your husband talked about uh, <laughs> very soon on the show. Uh, so um, we, we wanted to first start with uh, where we're at right now, you know, before we go backwards. So we are, this is June 30, just for the record, June 30, 2020. And we are in a, not a very good place as far as the coronavirus pandemic uh, is concerned. Um, the situation uh, in general in the, in, the, in the world that we are almost at uh, 10 million, 10 and a half million confirmed cases. We had, we passed a half a million deaths. Uh, we had, about five, we're approaching 5.5 million recoveries in the United States. 25% of all cases are in the United States, 2.68 million. And 25% of all the deaths in the world are in the United States. In Michigan, South of, we have about 70,000 cases and we uh, passed uh, 6,100 uh, uh, deaths. Uh, but we are doing better. Uh, we are one of the states that are, you know, have, have had strict lockdowns and we're doing better right now, although not, um, we're not in New Zealand, let me put it this way. Uh, so tell us about uh, the coronavirus in your area of, uh, uh, of the world, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about you personally. Sure. Right. So I think, you know, this experience has been so different for people in the United States. Everyone now knows who their mayor is and who their governor is. They might not have known, you know, six months ago because it didn't necessarily seem so relevant to everyone. But it certainly brought home the importance of local politics, state politics, and having well-qualified people with sensible perspectives to be in leadership at these different levels of government. But uh, New Jersey was, you know, one of the hardest hit states, uh, especially right at the beginning, uh, right after New York. So we've had, I believe, over 12,000 deaths in, uh, in New Jersey, although now it is slowing down very much. And we're in a reopening stage in New Jersey, although the governor is being relatively careful. Right now we can have outdoor dining, the plan was to allow 25% capacity for indoor dining next week, but he's decided to postpone that indefinitely because of the rise in cases in other states. Um, in our town, we have about 118 positive uh, cases and uh, seven deaths. And five of those deaths were in a senior care facility. Um, as a mayor, seeing this pandemic approaching, uh, you know, reading about it in China, doing what preparations we could for our emergency medical services and our health department. We were having periodic meetings, but I think actually when we started seeing it really, really take off in Italy, that's when I started really feeling like this is coming to us very soon and preparing and thinking about how can we shut things down. And um, to me, it shows how 
also important it is to have people in local office who have a global perspective because this world is very interconnected right now. There's no such thing as you know being immune from what's happening in the rest of the world. And if, unfortunately, I think Americans a lot of times have this sense of American exceptionalism, like, oh, crazy things happen in the rest of the world, but it's never gonna come to us. It's never gonna impact us. And frankly, I think that that did hinder some people's ability to really think creatively and to take strong measures because it just seemed so out of the norm for a, Americans to have to abide by a curfew or for Americans to have to think in this way. Um, but, you know, I was definitely preparing for the worst, being an academic and doing research in history, thinking about the flu pandemic of 1918, reading as much as I could about it, what strategies worked, um, and also reading as much as I could about leadership in a pandemic uh, that I could get my hands on. And another interesting thing that I noticed is that some of the mayors who took the strictest measures in New Jersey early on were South Asian. You know, the mayor of Hoboken shut down and had a curfew on his town before the governor had even declared that. So again, I think having those international broad perspectives where we've seen places have to do these sort of guidelines did help and did help push the conversation. Um, so we shut down relatively early. We closed our municipal building to the public on March 13th. That's also when our local public schools closed down uh, mm -hmm. before the state had mandated it. And then, um, so it was, was before that, we had- Was that your decision? Uh, shutting down the municipal building was, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. It was you know done in consultation with our township administrator and the rest of the township committee. But, you know, I definitely was, in favor of erring on the side of caution because I felt like, you know, people's, these are life and death, de death decisions and it will weigh on my conscience. And I had a lot of sleepless nights and anticipation as I felt this getting closer to us. And unfortunately, we just didn't have the national leadership that we would have expected in a situation like this where they would tell us, okay, it's time to shut down, it's time to do this. And so seeing that lack of leadership, I think that's really when local and state officials realized, okay, we have to do it because nothing is coming to us telling us what to do or helping us. Um, so, you know, it's always been my philosophy to make the change that I can in the sphere that I can make that change. And certainly I am empowered as a mayor to make decisions, to close things down, to be more um, careful. So we had also closed down our parks before it had, the guidance had come down to close down parks and you know covered the playground so that we didn't have children kind of congregating and um but then you know soon thereafter the governor of new jersey also did institute a curfew and stay at home orders and you know he has been very proactive and um and concerned about the safety of the public so you know, we were working in coordination. Our county officials were also very communicative. I had daily calls with our county and all the mayors, calls with our congressmen, calls with our uh, senators. So we definitely had are lucky to have had good leadership thinking creatively about how to address this crisis. Great, uh, but very uh, particularly, you've uh, shut down before even the state uh, did. Uh, which yeah. is very uh, it's, uh, it's it shows leadership really we haven't i haven't seen um, much of these examples where the mayor actually does it before the state uh, in michigan we shut down in march 13 too but it was a state that made that decision um so uh, sort of going back a little bit i'm going to be going back and forth um so as this journey that ended up with you being the mayor, but before that, there was also a very interesting journey, which is the academic journey. So um, uh, you have uh, went to George Washington uh, University, Georgetown, right? Um, and your bachelor's was in, uh, what was it again? It was in the School of Foreign Service, and my yeah. major was Regional Studies of the Islamic World. So tell us, wh why did you pick that major? Where did that story start? Yeah. Sure. So, you know, I think being the child of immigrants, being a South Asian Muslim uh, person growing up, born and raised in Chicago, being in the middle of lots of different cultures and constantly having to kind of make decisions about how to acculturate and understand the difference between different cultures and being that kind of bridge between cultures was the story of my upbringing. And um, 
when I was in high school, I went on a school trip to Turkey, actually. And that's when I realized how much of a fascination I had with different cultures, understanding them. And I was lucky that my parents um, both worked for airlines when I was growing, growing up, so we got to travel a lot. And again, I just had such a fasc fascination for different cultures and wanting to help people understand each other. So towards the end of high school, I thought I wanted to go into diplomacy. And when was that? Where was I in high school? Yes. Uh, I went to the Latin School of Chicago. It's a private school in Chicago. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Um, and so I thought I wanted to go into diplomacy. I you know, was researching colleges. Neither of my parents went to college in the United States. So I kind of had to educate myself on what all the schools are. And I remember when I saw, learned about the School of Foreign Service, I thought, oh, this is really perfect. It was really kind of like my dream program in school. And I was you know, fortunate enough to get in. And um, I, I, I loved the entire program. But interestingly, I, I interned at the State Department. I interned with the Marine Corps. But it was really my history and literature classes that captured my imagination. And um, I think especially this is the time that I was in college, um, the September 11th attacks happened during my first week of college. And so um, that really shaped so much of my intellectual curiosity and questions and trying to understand Islam and Islamic history. Um, and so that that guided me to have a passion for my academic studies. And I had mentors in my professors, especially my academic uh, advisor, who told me that I should consider a career in academia. You know, no one in my family had been in academia, so it's not really a path that I understood or that I had thought about. But because of that encouragement, I did some undergraduate research programs. And um, after uh, college, I went to India for two years to study Urdu language. And that's kind of what prepared me to apply for my PhD, researching Islam in South Asia. So um, uh, yes, it's a question. So um, you, the first of all, that's this program in in Georgetown. It's a program by the State Department, or is it a? Program? No, no. Actually, the School Foreign Service was established before the United States Foreign Service, oh, uh, wow. but it, it is about international affairs. So when I was there, there were six majors, which were international politics, international economics, international political economy, mm -hmm. <laughs> culture and politics, and then- You know, to an international family because they're, you know, they're airline uh, workers, yes. uh, well travelers. You feel that they have, uh, you know, you, you are not an engineer or a doctor. Right. So you have to answer the question why <laughs> yes. in our culture, you know? Yes. So they have, the, you, you would give them the credit for pointing you or encouraging you in that, in that direction? Right. Well, I mean, growing up, definitely my parents and my extended family literally said, you know, if you're smart and you do good in school, you have to become a doctor. And I'm always a rebellious type. So I was like, why? No, I don't have to do anything. Um, and so I was always kind of rebelling against that. But uh, but I think that definitely my parents both have a passion for travel and learning about different cultures, too. And that's why they did pick to be in the airline industry and take us on all these trips growing up. So that interest is definitely inherited from my family. But also, I think they have such an interesting background. You know, our family is originally from South Asia, from um, a, an, a province or a state called Gutch, which is in India, but is a borderline uh, state between India and Pakistan. And uh, my mom was actually raised in Iran. My dad was born and raised in Aden, in Yemen. So their families were also very international <laughs> for generations. And so that's also a part of their histories. And it was always something that really interested me. So um, absolutely, I think that that background and just trying to understand like what ties these places together, what are these different cultures and how do I understand myself uh, is what fueled me to do this. And as I said, I was always a stubborn, rebellious uh, person. Mm -hmm. So my parents didn't really have much choice but to accept my decision. But I did have my ways of convincing them and saying, okay, I won't be a doctor, but I'll be a doctor of philosophy. So that was my uh, strategy to get them to kind of come around to it. And definitely, okay. I would say get going to Georgetown and going to Harvard definitely helped um, convince them that, you know, I was doing something right. So you still, with all that, you still had some resistance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I think... 
Okay, give a message, please, to to uh, South Asian uh, parents, to Arab American parents, for when their kids want to go to a humanities uh, career, you know, and they worry, and, and sometimes their worry is legitimate because they're first generation immigrants and they just want to see some stability in their lives eventually. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, can you give them a message about about the opportunities? Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think, as you said, the worry and concern about the financial stability of your children is absolutely normal and it makes sense. And I will say that there were times during my PhD when I thought, you know, I should, I should have become a doctor. <laughs> like in this much time, I could have become a medical doctor as well. Um, but there are so many paths out there. And, uh, you know, with a humanities degree, you can do all different types of work. You know, it's not that you are so frozen into a particular line of work just because of a major, at least in the contemporary American, you know, job market, you can go into all different types of fields. So there is a lot of, there's a lot of possibilities out there. I'm a big proponent of like career searching and doing all sorts of quizzes and guides and understanding yourself and your skills. Because ultimately, if you're doing something that you're passionate about, you're going to succeed much more. Uh, so I would say, you know, don't worry too much, but also I wouldn't berate parents. You know, I definitely have bought my five-year-old all sorts of doctor's kits and, you know, things like that. So I'm not immune to this either. Uh, right. But definitely there is a lot of promise and a lot of opportunities in the humanities. And what I found interesting is, as I said, when I was younger, I was always this like rebellious person. Like, what is she doing? What is she studying? We don't really get it. And now I'm invited to give talks at the mosque and to yeah. give talks in all sorts of contexts. I'm like, oh, me? You want you want me to come and you want me to meet your daughters? And you know, I think that there is definitely more open-mindedness in the community now and seeing how important it is to have people from our community definitely in positions of political power and influence, but all different fields. We cannot only be concentrated in a couple of fields. Right. Not only that, but also the question and one of the things that motivated you is that you were searching for that identity, right? Um, um, and uh, that question, the question of identity, is the question of our time as far as Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, even Arabs and Muslims in general. Like there is, you know, re-questioning of uh, and reshaping of identities. And you will be shaping that. You will be participating in that conversation. Uh, this is how important it is compared to, you know, uh, other cases. Um, the, the, the finances has, we, we should learn as a community not to put, finances as a priority uh, given the the identity identity challenges that we have they're sometimes more important than the financial challenges um, so yeah so thank you for encouraging parents uh, uh, on that i have a few questions i want to uh, share with you here uh, there is the arab arab research and advocacy bureau are you have you heard of them um they have, uh, they're one of the people watching this program. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a comment, sort of, right? There is, uh, this is also because there's a lack of, they're talking about the corona when we were talking about the pandemic. Uh, the lack of leadership of the top, at the top in the US, local mayors are like demi presidents in the states right now. You have a comment on that? Absolutely. I think when there's a vacuum of leadership, then other people have to step up. And that is what has happened. I mean, it would be great if we had a really coherent national strategy and it was just coming from the top and we all knew where the ventilators were, where the PPE was, you know, what should we be doing? But unfortunately, it's actually, we're getting the wrong, the misinformation from some of our leaders at the top saying, oh, masks, who, who needs them and who needs testing and all of that. So in that context, I think, we all found ourselves thinking, okay, we're scrambling, it's up to us. We're seeing, as I said, I was really very, very disturbed seeing what was happening in Italy and Iran as well, um, because that those were the places that were really heating up before it really got to the US and thinking, you know, there, there are people dying in huge numbers and they're so sick and the hospitals are overwhelmed. And so what I don't wanna wait for that to happen. You know, I need to do everything that I can in my power to stop that from happening or slow it down from happening. And so, in fact, Montgomery has one of the lowest rates of infection and death in the state of New Jersey. And I'm proud of that. It's not just because of me, the, the people in the public have been very much abiding by masking guidelines. And we do live in an area that is suburban where people tend to be a little bit more spread out, but it, it all adds up, you know, so you have yeah. to kind of, 
steel yourself. And it's a scary thought to shut down the schools. It's a scary thought to close down your municipal building and tell everyone to stay home. But, you know, I, 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 ha I thankfully had good people I was working with and I could share things with them and then gain the courage to say, okay, yes, we have to do this. Then you had your journey in Harvard and your journey in, uh, in Princeton. Um, when you decided to run for mayor for, for uh, uh, Montgomery Township, um, did you, what brought that idea to you? Sure. Yeah. So I, um, frankly, in my life, I had always lived in democratic areas. I had lived in Chicago. I went to school in DC and Boston. And it wasn't until I moved to New Jersey that I ended up in a Republican congressional district and a Republic, a town that had an all Republican local government. And that disturbed me to some degree because I felt like my elected officials really did not share my values and were kind of in on the national level very hawkish in terms of military intervention and you know were very like my congressman was very opposed to anything that President Obama was trying to do um, and that got me thinking that people like myself who were advocates for certain things like human rights issues it didn't matter how many times I called my congressman's office, he was never going to agree with me. And that motivated me to think, you know, it would be better if people like myself were just the decision makers, because then we would make the decisions based on our values, based on our education and our understanding. And so I was getting towards the end of my PhD. People were asking me what, what I was gonna do after I finished. And I started saying this crazy thing in 2013, like, well, maybe I'll run for office. I have no idea how to do it. I've never known anyone who's done it. Um, and then one of my friends from California actually told me about the Emerge program, which is for women from the Democratic Party who want to run for office. And I Googled it and it was starting in New Jersey that year. So I applied and I got in. And that's actually where I learned the nuts and bolts of how to run for office, how to connect to your state party and your county party and your local party. Um, and I think it's important to mention that because especially like immigrant communities and other communities that have not had access to polit political power traditionally, it's really important for us to have formal training and mentorship programs, whether it's in for politics or law or really any other field, we need, it's just very helpful to have those training programs. So it was because of that program that I really connected to mm -hmm. different levels. And, you know, I was engaged with my local Democratic Party and the, um, district's party and i was campaigning for someone who was running for congress when i was asked to run for my local government and that is often how it works you are asked to run and uh research shows that women need to be asked three times to run so for everyone who's watching this is your first time i'm asking you to consider running for office there's so many offices out there and we really knew do need diverse representation right uh, so running in a in a in a uh, township that is uh, predominantly uh, white, sixty seven percent almost right, uh, and also uh, kind of there it has diversity also, twenty six percent registered Democrats, about twenty six percent registered Republicans, or twenty five percent and fifty percent uh, unaffiliated. Uh, how do you win the hearts and uh, minds of this diverse community? Absolutely. Well, I think first it's educating, you know, and being a person from an education background, that came naturally to me. What I realized very quickly is that most people in my town had no idea what their local government was. When I would go knocking on doors, I had the first thing I would ask is, do you know anything about the local government in Montgomery? And most people would say, no, I have no clue. So I would tell them, you know, we have a five person committee, there are elections every year for a three year term. And currently, it's all Republican. And I had this one woman step out of her house and look around and say, you mean this is a Republican area? Like she'd never looked at her neighbors that way before. And what it was really was, especially the Democrats were just not engaged. They weren't voting and they were not voting down the line. They were not voting for local office. They might vote at the top of the ticket. So there was a lot of education just telling people that First of all, that it's possible to have a Democrat elected in this town because there hadn't even been candidates running for a few years. Um, that there is that break breakdown because it was an all Republican governing body. People just thought, oh, everyone in this town must be a registered Republican. And so I would educate them that no, actually it's pretty evenly split and the independents could really go either way depending on how you convince them. And my strategy was really 
getting connected to all the local organizations, going to their events, whether it was the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or the South Asian community event or, um, you know, whatever, whatever local events I could go to and getting to meet people, getting to meet different constituencies, seeing what their concerns were, what did they want to see changed. Um, and I think people really responded well to that. And my campaign was all very positive about focusing on the value of community building. That's really what I wanted to see, because as you said, it is a majority white community, but there's a significant Asian American population and there are other minority communities as well, but it's a community that's also grown in population a lot in the last 20 years, 20, 30 years. And so that can lend itself to social fracturing if people don't connect with each other. And it's something that I had witnessed and seen on the local you know, Facebook community boards and things like that that, oh, those people are X or the newcomers are changing things. And so- and that's the mosaic. Yes, yes. That you created, yes. Exactly. Um, did you have, did you, would you say overall it was a positive experience running for office for? Yeah, I would, I would. I mean, I think it gives you an opportunity to learn a lot about your community and meet people that you probably wouldn't have met otherwise. and and just see what all are all the groups that are out there what are they doing what what kind of constitutes the the core of the community and what i find it find in montgomery is that there is a real service oriented ethos like we have two volunteer fire companies our ems is completely volunteer so people give a lot of their time for their community and i think that that's really valuable very um, engaged community. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's really what, that's the spirit that I found was really powerful and I wanted to encourage it more. And um, I, so even for the most part, it, it, it was positive. There, there were negatives. There's always um, someone's running against you. You put, you put your name out there and you're gonna be judged and people are gonna either pick you or not pick you. So that's kind of nerve wracking. Um, but I didn't go into it thinking that I have to win. I went into it thinking either way, I'm helping educate the community on the political system. I'm getting people engaged who might not have been engaged otherwise. Um, and I think we have to build in that manner. We cannot think in like the short term. Everything that we're building is a long-term project. So that's that's always how I think about it. So of where you know my, my I knew this problem was gonna happen with me when I talked to you because I have a lot I want to talk about. We didn't even get to the personal part yet. So, but um, first of all, there's something uh, some noise from your mic. Is it? Uh, no, maybe it's just make sure it's not touching something. Okay, and um, a final question about that: Do you have intention to run for further office? I don't have a particular office in mind. Um, to me, as I said, it's it's not about a particular short-term goal or even long-term goal for me. The most important thing for me is that the values that I hold dear are being implemented. And so if there was an opportunity where the person who was in that position I didn't agree with and that I had support from my community to run against them or something like that, I would consider it, but I don't really have a particular office in mind. Okay, um, we 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 hope the best for you. I think you're a, a long-term asset uh, to America and to the community. Thank you. Um, let's take some of the uh, questions that we usually take uh, in the program. First of all, so during this pandemic, uh, at a personal level, Salaf, so you're uh, a mayor, is one of the people who meets people on a regular basis, uh, engaging with the community on a regular basis, and all of a sudden now uh, there's more isolations or more measures. How did that change influence you? How did you receive it? Uh, how, what were your feelings at that time? It's hard. I'm definitely an extrovert. Um, I'm definitely a people person. I get a lot of energy meeting people and interacting with them. And so shifting to a fully kind of online life for the most part was was difficult. And I definitely had my moments where I'm like, get me out of here. <laughs> like I can't, I feel so confined and this is not natural and I don't like it. Um, but I'm very privileged to have a nice home that is very comfortable. I have space, you know. Um, and so I've made my little 
world here in my home office and you know trying to connect with the public the best way i can from here um and you know i think i've i've tried to make the best of it and tried to um make sure that i focus on communication because i don't want others to feel isolated either and so some of the projects that i've worked on is you know, we established a crisis communications plan. We were at first emailing the community every single day with the numbers, and then we went down to three times a week. Um, I have been doing regular mayor's video updates, and um, that gives me a sense of purpose, you know, that I'm trying to help people navigate and, mm -hmm. and get through this crisis the best I can. Um, I definitely think that I'm not able to do so much for my own family because of that. And that's a tough balance. Cause I, I as I said, I have a five-year-old daughter and so she'll want to play. And I'm like, I am sorry, I have meetings and I will have meetings, you know, all day and all night. So it's tough, but you know, I think it's, it's, that's what public service is about. And it's making things better for the entire community, not just for her, but you know, I wish I could focus on her a little bit more too. Sort of, uh, um, so is there is there something that uh, you've you've been able to accomplish or do during this pandemic that you wouldn't have been able to do before uh, mm -hmm. because of just you know the the different daily schedule? Right, right. Well, I mean, I think that we have um, we've really improved our communications, you know, that we have really streamlined them. We figured out what are the best ways to get in contact with the community. We've set up a dial-in hotline. We have, um, you know, a website that we created called Montgomery Together that features community videos, including businesses, the schools. It's a collaborative project with the local school district. So I think working especially closer with the school district is something that I had wanted to do, but hadn't really had an opportunity to do. And so I've been much more in contact with them. As I said, I've been much more in contact with all of the other mayors in my county, the mayor's call with our governor's office. And so learning a lot from what other places are doing. Um, so improving communications has definitely been one thing that this has kind of pushed along and we're, we're, we're well on our way. Also, I think. Are you a, a fan? Of, are you a fan of virtual communication or with you know this type of technology? Absolutely, and I think that it allows access to people who otherwise were not coming into out to our in-person events. You know, so as I said, Montgomery Mosaic was started two years ago, and we would have you know on average about thirty people come to an event. The most we ever had was one hundred and fifty, but we we had a. Um, vigil and a Montgomery Speaks Out Against Racism event where we had 188 people logged on online. And then so many more people have seen the video as well. So I, you know, my thought is when hopefully we get back to a more normalcy, I, I think we should alternate, you know, have some events in person, but also continue to have some events virtually, mm -hmm. especially for accessibility purposes and make sure that we are reaching those people who just can't make it to an in-person event. Yeah, this is one of the historical results uh, after this pandemic is that uh, we're, we're going to have whatever w would have taken maybe 50 years or, or 10 years, 20 years uh, to incorporate technology into our public space uh, is, is taken, you know, it's going to take one or two years. Um, it's already done. So um, I consider that a positive thing. It is going to enhance our communication. Although I hope it doesn't add to the social isolation that we already suffered from before, right? <laughs> before right. the pandemic. Uh, at a personal level, did you? Uh, I know this is very hard to ask a public official, but <laughs> have you done something at a um, at a personal level? That's um, sometimes when a person have a passion for their job, like you, uh, you don't distinguish between. <laughs> the personal but have you learned how to bake bread that seems like a thing now and <laughs> no 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 mm -hmm. i have not done any of those kind of hobby like things except for really focusing on my wardrobe in terms of blouses <laughs> that mm -hmm. i wear um and that's about it like mm -hmm. zoom fashion is probably my one uh hobby but otherwise it's it's really is all work all the time but as you said it's my passion and, um, you know, 
one of the, it's community building has always been very central to me. And one of the things that we've been able to really focus on as a, as a country is combating racism. It's something that, you know, mostly Americans are so busy working all the time. And so even though we were aware that these issues were there in the air around us, we just didn't have a moment to pause and come together and say, okay, we need to change things now. And so I really think that the pandemic environment did give this country an opportunity to all together witness some horrible things and say, this has to stop. We have to change the system. We have to improve things. And that is moving much faster. And, uh, revolution or the movement to uh, really face uh, racism uh, for one, you know, for, for in, a, in a, the most effective way possible uh, now and to, to end that long give and take, you know, seems things don't change uh, over years. Uh, this has going to change our world also permanently. Uh, something that is, would have taken years uh, is also being accomplished in uh, 2020. I, th I don't know. I feel like although all these challenges, I feel it's, it's a good year historically. I don't know. It's tough. It's tough when, you know, I mean, what, a hundred, course, a hundred, people, whatever a thousand people have died in America. Yeah, it's difficult so, to say that. It's yeah. difficult to say that when you have all these uh, deaths and injuries. But, but I hope that these are catalysts towards change. I mean, we we know that biology is going to uh, uh, get us every once in a while. Um, but you know, maybe this will wake us up to to the importance of, of so many things that we've probably neglected before. Uh, we have uh, Kathy Brown from Argentina. She asks, what do you think the ideal outcome of this pandemic at a personal level and at a collective level? Well, uh, I, I really want to establish some initiatives in the township that I've been working on in terms of um, an anti-racism task force and looking at all of our municipal practices and making sure that we are as focused on equity as possible. So that's something on a personal level, as I said, there's so little separation between personal and professional, um, but that's really what I want to see. At a collective level, I hope that we strive for the ideals that we want in our society. Don't accept the status quo. Realize that, honestly, we can change anything if we put our minds to it. I think the shift in terms of the acceptance of the Black Lives Matter movement from now as opposed to a few years ago, it shows that drastically, you know, mm -hmm. that when the movement first started, people thought, oh, this is too radical. It's never gonna take off for the majority of Americans. They're never gonna see it positively. Now the majority of Americans are like, yeah, Black Lives Matter, I agree. And so it was, it was just kind of shocking to me when I first started seeing things like my governor saying Black Lives Matter and, you know, all of these corporations and stuff also saying it. But it just goes to show if you have an ideal, you have something that's worth fighting for and worth advocating for, do it. And, you know, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's a difficult time. Horrible things are happening, but we also can take the opportunity to make some of that change that was stalled because people were just too busy and too fractured and not able to join together in a strong movement. Um, so at the collective level, I hope that we live and abide by our values. And I certainly hope that we have new leadership in this country <laughs> relatively soon. Yeah. We paid a very heavy price. Uh, uh, Shireen Slayman asks, what is one thing that you have already experienced that you feel helped you be most prepared for this situation? Hmm. It's hmm. a tough one. Um, I think, you know, you definitely your traumas in life are are sad. They're they're difficult experiences, but they do strengthen you. Like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I've had my share of those. Uh, I had a I had a, you know, traumatic birth experience in in which I really did understand the importance and significance that race plays even in medical care in this country. And so I think that that has made me very sensitive to uh, systemic racism and made it very personal to me, even though I know that relatively, especially compared to Black Americans, I do have a level of privilege. So 
uh, even though that, that was difficult and traumatic for me and a very sad experience, I think that it has helped me have more empathy and understand just how powerful these forces are and how important it is to overcome them. Thank you. Uh, Hadi Shatila asks, uh, what is the worst thing COVID-19 pandemic made you discover about yourself? Hmm. Worst thing about me? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, well, I mean, I think it's that I'm always, I just keep myself very busy and I don't really take time to pause. Before I was always driving all over the state for hours on end for different events. And now I'm on Zoom calls from like the moment I wake up till the moment I collapse in bed. So I think it's that I, equilibrium and balance is probably not my strength. But I also feel like this isn't really a time for equilibrium and balance. And there's so much work I want to do. And there's so much that has to be done. So I don't know how healthy that is. But that's that's my mode of operating. I mean, and thank you for being on our show, Sadaf. I mean, I know you're, you're a, a busy person. But thank you for giving us this history, historical record. Uh, Talal asks, what's the best thing the pandemic has made you discover about yourself? that I care. I just really care about every single person in this township. You know, when we got that first information about the first fatality in our town, that really hit me, that really hurt, you know? And similarly with the employees of the township, like I feel like we need to, we need to have an ethic of care in government, in business, in everything, because when we lose that, we lose our humanity. And so I'm glad that I still care and that I haven't been hardened or, you know, I haven't lived up to the stereotype of politicians that, oh, they don't care about anything. Like, I care. And if I do, I'm sure many, many of the other elected officials mm -hmm. out there do as well. So um, I think it's just keeping, keeping always reminding myself, like, why am I doing this? And uh, that, that I do continue to be values driven in my work. Right. I mean, as a mayor, I would imagine that this pandemic is one of the hardest challenges that a mayor can face, especially lives are at stake and uh, national government is kind of leaving it to the locals to decide. A lot of pressure. So, you know, commend you that you probably didn't think about that when you signed up. <laughs> no. no, and definitely not with, you know, having to homeschool my child at the same time. And mm -hmm. uh, it definitely is not anything that any of us signed up, signed up for. I'm in a much better situation than a lot of people are, but that stress definitely does weigh on you. Mm -hmm. Hanan asks, like, what do you do when you want to heal yourself? What is healing for you? Um, the arts are always, you know, where I turn to for healing. So I read poetry, I listen to music, I dance, I really have to, you know, the arts are definitely the place that I go when I when I feel hopeless, I find a poem about that hopelessness. And somehow it feeds my soul and makes me feel better. And um, even in my mayor's videos, I often, you know, would share poems just because I think that there there is something about the arts and the humanities that touch, touches our hearts, and we really need that right now um, to sustain ourselves. Yeah, and you speak in Urdu and Persian and Arabic and yeah. French. These are all yeah. the languages of uh, poetry. Yes, I'm very lucky in that way. What's one of your favorite poets? Do you have one um, in particular? I have so many, but lately I've been reading a lot of um, like. Uh, black women's poetry. So reading a lot of Audre Lorde and uh, sharing, trying to share that with the community as well. Um, I think it's really important for non-Black people of color to elevate and focus on Black voices. And so when I've been invited to speak at rallies or uh, you know Black Lives Matter events, I've always tried to feature a Black poet or a thinker because um, it's this is this is a part of our heritage as Americans that we don't always learn about, and um, so trying to use my platform to bring more attention to those intellectuals and poets as well. Awesome. Uh, we have a question from. I think this is a good question for you. Uh, it says at times of crisis such as this, do you prefer authoritarianism to ensure public safety, 
or stick to democracy and liberalism? Uh, definitely the latter. <laughs> I don't think I would ever prefer authoritarianism. Um, mm. I think that. Did you feel, did you feel that, that that some decisions you had to make uh, that you know that that were tough for people to uh, to uh, you know accept, or did you fear that people will take this as authoritarianism? Right. Well, I definitely have been accused of that. When the parks were closed, um, you know, the mayor just hates parks and she doesn't want us to breathe fresh air and she wants us she all to stay home. <laughs> she hates children. She hates kids. Um, so that was, you know, it was that was stressful to think about. And there were people who were very, very angry when the tennis courts were closed. But I just tried to brush it off and thought ultimately what I'm doing is for their benefit. It's it's you know, I, it's done in consultation with our health department and I was elected <laughs> to represent them. So they kind of have to deal with me for the time being. If they don't like my leadership, they can vote for someone else the next time around. Um, so I still think, you know, definitely democracy is preferable, but I do think that we need to at the same time cultivate a sense of, you know, community responsibility. Like it cannot be that all, all that matters is me. That's not right. Yeah. I mean, we have to be uh, so, working for our neighbors and 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 taking care of each other. And that's always my message. Like, please wear your masks because that's helping your neighbors. Right. It is too much pressure on mayors and governors these days, as if their decisions is the ones that. I mean, there are CDC guidelines. People have to be responsible too. It's not only about rules and enforcement. You know. Um, okay. So uh, I have a question here from uh, Shada. Uh, she said, if you were a, po a policymaker during COVID-19 pandemic, which in your case, you're close to that, <laughs> what kind of policy would you make? Is there a policy that you made that you wish you can make it at a nationwide? I think it's just a slow opening and really keeping things closed as much as possible and telling people to mask. and. Um, enforcing social distancing, enforcing physical distancing. That's really what has kept our community safe is that people have been abiding by those things. People have been mostly eating at home and not socializing so much with other people. Um, it's very, very hard to do. I understand the psychological toll that it takes and it takes economic resources as well. Um, but I wish that you know our, our federal government was clearly encouraging people to do those things instead of sending mi mixed messages. Because if the leadership is out and about with no mask, not abiding by distancing, having events where people are crowded together, then that sends a, a confusing message to the public because the public looks to their leaders, right, for leadership and like, okay, well, if they're doing it, then it must be safe, it must be fine. Mm -hmm. So what I wish is that our that we had a cohesive strategy at the national level that was more along the lines of what we've been doing in my town, in my county, in my state, which is, you know, being very careful, not opening too quickly, encouraging all of the guidelines and trying to be on the same page about these things. Okay, uh, because we, uh, we're running out of time, I'm going to take some of the recommend recommendations from you, Sadaf. So uh, first of all, do you have a film that you like to recommend to our audience? Oh my goodness. Um, 13th. Uh, I think that it's so important for us to learn about the history of mass incar incarceration in this country and how it relates to uh, the Black community and their experiences. Film recommendation is a documentary called 13. 13th. 13th, yeah. Yes. So it's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the last film you've seen? It was actually 13th. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what book do you recommend? Uh, what book are you reading now? And what book do you recommend? Um, I am reading a book about Black history in our region called If These Stones Could Talk. And it is written by these two women who are actually starting an African-American heritage museum in my town. Nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. So your town is going to have an African-American heritage museum. Yes. Very proud of that. I wish I had time to ask you more about that. Um, 
if stones can talk. If these stones could talk. These stones. These stones could. That's one of the influential books in your life, Salaf. And you know, you're a very well learned person, and I'm sure you have those ones. Yes. Yeah. Um. Let's see. There's there's a book that I read in high school called. Um, uh, well, actually, it's a book that I read when I was in elementary school called uh, Somehow Tenderness Survives. I've always been very interested in the history of South Africa. And it talks about the stories of children and going into their teenage years in the midst of apartheid. Um, and I think that stories like that for children to read and then young adults really do shape our understanding of the world. and breed empathy. So that's just something that comes to my mind of something that I read, read as a young age that really made me think about inequality and injustice. Interesting. What's the name of it again? Somehow Tenderness Survives. Somehow Tenderness Survives. Thank you. Uh, in the final few minutes, uh, is, there, is there one more recommendation maybe? Uh, would you like to recommend something in music or website? Yeah. Give us something. Yes. Give me something. Um, so let's see. In music, um, I've actually been listening to the top one hundred top one hundred Nigeria pop music uh, really? on, Apple, on Apple Music. Um, <laughs> It just makes me feel great and happy. And and so, music? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I've discovered lately? Mm. Funk music from Sudan. Mm. <laughs> That's amazing. That is, yeah. Okay. Uh, final question, sort of, and uh, it has been a, a great journey with you today, and thank you for your time uh, and for everything that you're doing. You're such a role model, really. Um, I feel like I told you before, before the interview, that uh, I feel that uh, we have a lot of interviews uh, upcoming, you know, because there's a lot of topics that you're an expert of and you're a great person to speak about. Um, and I'm glad that you're open uh, for, for these invitations. Uh, the final question is a personal question. You'll answer it and uh, we'll end the show with it. Uh, the question is if uh you had a closet in your in your home a magical closet in your bedroom that you open that closet you go in and it teleports you to a specific place every time where would that place be mm. i think it would actually be beirut uh, interestingly enough, I've just spent a lot of great times there. I have a lot of great memories there and some of my happiest moments. So I guess that's where I would go. Awesome. You'll meet me there. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> thank you, Sada, very much. Sure. Um, thank you again for everything that you, you're doing. You're, um, you are paving the way for so many uh, minorities, immigrants, uh, um, all kind of you know, this is women, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, South Asian Americans, um, for you know to to actually uh, they're encouraged to pursue their uh, education in human humanities to run for office. Uh, you've set the example in each one of these things. So um, there's no words that can describe the appreciation that we have of uh, of you. And thank you for doing this with us. And uh, I hope to stay safe and have a great rest of the year. You too. Take care. Thank you.